Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about the impedance motion control. If you remember, when we talked about the motion and the hybrid force motion control, we had one big assumption and the assumption was the environment is in, in infinitely rigid. So it's not going to deform, right? And that makes your robot to treat a very hard object the same way that it treats you, it treats a soft object or anything else, right? So if you don't basically consider that fact, the robot can apply basically the same amount of force as I said to a human, then the same way that it does it to a wall or a very, very solid hard object. And again, that makes the robot be quite dangerous, breaking a bunch of things that are not really rigid and so on. So that's where we talk about this idea of impedance, which is basically the resistance of objects against deformation. The higher the impedance of a surface is, the higher it will, the more it will resist to deformation. And that's the idea behind this uh, method of control called impedance motion control. So this idea says this, if in a direction I anticipate I am handling or I'm touching a hard surface, then... I'm okay with what? With, uh, or if I'm free to move, I'm okay with doing a stiff motion control, which means using big gains, using high amount of torques on the joints and moving very fast, very accurately, and uh, trying to make your, uh, trying to meet your desired trajectory. But in case, I expect that, no, I have to handle a soft object, right? Or I come into contact with an object that will have deformation. I'll do what you call soft motion control. So basically, I'll try to accommodate a little bit the deformation of that object and not to expect to exactly follow without any error the desired trajectory. So I sacrifice basically a little bit of uh, motion or tracking accuracy for what? For not applying a tremendous amount of force to the environment in order to follow that path. Okay, so that's the idea of impedance control which is kind of a, like an adaptive to the environment control. How do we define impedance? Uh, for the impedance, uh, we can model the surfaces to act like a spring. So if you apply the force F to a surface and the amount of deformation in it is X, and if we show this relation by a linear spring relation, F equal negative KX, correct? We can also say that the work that you have done on the surface or the energy that you spend is equal to one half k times x final squared minus what? x initial squared. And again, the bigger this k value is, you clearly can see that the smaller the deformation is going to be for a specific amount of force. So bigger k means bigger stiffness or uh, we can call it bigger impedance. Now, the impedance is not exactly, when we talk in the literature of control of robots, we don't exactly define impedance as the stiffness. The definition of the impedance is a little bit different. So, in general, we can define an operator called impedance operator, and we define it to be the Laplace of the force on that uh, object or part, divided by the velocity, the resulting velocity of it, okay? That we call impedance. So you see clearly it's not just force divided by displacement, it's like force divided by velocity, 
and we define it in the Laplace domain. So this impedance is going to be a function of S, the uh, Laplace operator. So if it's if the object we just consider it as a pure spring, then what's going to happen? Your F is K times X, correct? And V is DX over DT. So this is going to be like K times X of S. But V is time derivative of X. And time derivative, you know, in Laplace domains means S times X of S. So if we do that, then when we simplify this, the Laplace operator for a spring is going to be K over S. Okay? If the element acts like a damper, then the force of a damper is what? The force of a damper is, as you know, the B, the constant of the damper, times the velocity, right? And velocity is, again, X, S times X of S, or you can just write it as V of S if you want, divided by V of S, correct? Which is in the denominator, so it's going to be just constant B. So if the element is a damper, it's just going to be a constant. If the element is a spring, it's going to be K over S. And if the element is just an inertia, a mass inertia, right? Then if this is F and this is V, you know F equals M times V dot or A, correct? M times A, acceleration. So clearly from here, F of S is going to be what? Is going to be M times the Laplace of V dot, which is S V of S. And if you divide it by V of S, then you will definitely get what? You will get M times S term. Okay, so this is the um, um, impedance operator for a mass in inertial block. This is for a damper. This is for a spring. And if your system has all of them, which is a mass spring damper system, then clearly your Laplace operator, since it's a linear operator, your impedance is going to be sum of all those three elements. So we can also categorize different types of impedances. And this is exactly based on what we did. If the uh, Laplace of impedance, if Z of S at S equals zero, if it's a constant like the damper, then we call it a resistive impedance. So it resists the motion. But the type of um, uh, behavior of that impedance is resistive. It doesn't like you to move. And that's exactly what damper does. It wants to damp the motion. It wants to kill the motion. And so that's exactly a resistive element. If the, sp the element is a spring, like K over S, if I evaluate this function at S of 0, you're going to get infinity. Right, so if it's infinite, then what? We call that element, what? We call it capacitive. And that's exactly what the spring does. It is like a capacitor. It stores the energy, right? So what the spring does is it's not just going to resist you to uh, or basically eliminate the energy in the system. It is going to store it into potential energy. On the other hand, if the element like M times S, you evaluate it at S of 0, it gives you 0 because it has uh, polynomial terms, S, S squared or something. We call it inertial, and that's exactly what a mass is. It is inertial. The goal of it is not to store, is not to waste, right? That's called an inertial element. So these are different types of impedance, and that's how you mathematically define impedance. So that's the basic thing. That's the idea of why we use impedance control, and that's the definition of impedance, right, so far. Now, with all that I said, let's take a look at the equations of motion and the control law, okay? One other thing I have to mention before all of that is the important thing that the goal of this method is to control the motion and control how accurately and how precisely you are following the desired trajectory 
when you are dealing with an object that does have impedance, when the object is not infinitely rigid, how would you handle it? The way you handle it is through a dynamic mass spring damper model. Okay, that I'm about to show you. And basically through the control law and through choosing the appropriate gains, you handle softer objects. It is not like you have tactile sensors or FT sensor on the wrist or on the end effector. Based on the force that you sense over there, you, you are going to change your control law or you're going to modify it. No. In this case, we are not going to have any force sensor. We are going to only um, basically modify the amount of force applied to the environment through a dynamic model that I'm about to tell you. So in this method, you are not going to have very accurate control over the force that the end effector applies to the environment. You just control the overall behavior of it, where to apply a little bit force, where to apply a lot of force and so on, but exactly how many newtons up to very decimals is not exactly possible because you have no feedback from your end effector. Okay? So your hope is, yes, this F that I apply F tip, or in this case, we show it with F A, I try to control the overall behavior of it, but again, not very, very accurate up to decimals or so. So how do we do it? Well, here, this is my equation of motion of the system in the joint space, right? That's what we had in the joint space, mq double dot plus c of q and q dot times q dot plus g of q equals the tau plus the term because of the force at the end effector f a or f tip that's the same as f tip in my previous videos the only difference you see here i'm using j a not j what is the difference between them i mentioned in one of my previous videos and j the regular j that we used all the time in the past is called a geometric jacobian of the robot while JA is called the analytic Jacobian of the robot, the difference is JA, we use it when for the end effector twist. When it goes to omega, omega is the angular velocity of the minimal representation of orientation or the pose of the robot. That's another way you can say it. The pose of the robot, when we describe the pose, Three components of it are the position of the end effector. They are the same. But the orientation of the end effector, instead of showing it with the rotation matrix, we show it with only what? With only three angles, like Euler angles. We show minimal representation. You know a rotation matrix is redundant. It has nine entries instead of three. So when we show pose, the pose is shown with what? minimal representation of orientation as i said like the euler angles okay or you can say that the end effector velocities is equal to analytic jacobian times what times q dot okay so this is not new we had this already now how do i choose my control law so this big thing that you can see here this is my control law and if I choose this control law, what does that give me? Well, let's take a look and see what it can give me. So if I apply this control law, this tau, the torques, to this uh, system of equations in the joint space, what's going to be the result? Okay, so let's go ahead and do it. And then we'll find exactly what's going on here. So... We want to combine these two together. Now here I have to mention a few things for you. So you know M, C, G, Tau, J, F, A, and everything. X desired uh, double dot, dot, and the X are clear, right? This X is the end effector pose. This is the desired end effector pose, and these are the time derivatives of them. 
Okay, so these are all clear. J dot is the time derivative of the analytic Jacobian. M is clear, that's the same M. The only new things that you see in this control law are three matrices. M sub M, D sub M, and K sub M. And these are the matrices that we call desired inertia, damping, and stiffness matrices. For what? For that mass spring damper model I just mentioned. The model we use to basically control the behavior of the robot when it is in contact with an object, with an object with impedance. Okay? But to see what is it that these matrices are doing, let's first combine the control law and the equations of motion, and then I will tell you what do I mean by mass spring damper system and what do I mean by controlling that. So let's first combine, see what, what's going on here. If I do so, I will get what? I will get MQ double dot plus C I don't write C of QQ dot, I just write C Q dot plus G is equal to that whole big thing, which is what? M J A inverse times braces, right? X double dot D minus J A dot Q dot. And then now you have plus M M inverse times k d times x dot d minus x dot plus k p x d minus x bracket closed brace closed plus c q dot plus g and then plus this last term here. Now this last term, I can show you mathematically that the last term here can also be written as this guy here on the right. So instead of the last term, I'm going to use this right hand side term, which is going to be MJA inverse M inverse times FA Right, I expanded minus J A transpose F A. So this whole big thing that I wrote for you so far is just the tau. And then plus what? Plus J A transpose F A. This is from the equation of motion. So this is the entire what? Equation of motion that we have. And uh, let's see what this one will lead to. Well, first thing that you can see is these two terms are going to go away. Good. So that makes life a lot easier. Then what? Then... This CQ dot term and this CQ dot term go away, and then this G goes away with the other G. Again, when we do control, this C is going to be like C hat, this G is going to be like G hat, this JA is going to be JA hat. So ideally, if my parameter estimation is very good, the terms in this tau are going to cancel a bunch of linear and nonlinear terms, right, and make the control law a lot simpler. So that's my hope, that my C hat is very close to C, G hat is very close to G. So if that is happening, then what do I get? Well, let's take a look. So now if you look, these terms that are remaining they all share the term m on their left hand side so if i multiply both sides by m inverse from left
then I should be able to get rid of M. And so what will remain is Q double dot is equal to all of the other terms. Now, if you look in the next term that you have, this one has J A inverse in it, and this one has J A inverse. So J A inverse can be factored out on the left from both of these terms. And when it's equal to Q A, Q double dot, what I can do is now I can multiply both sides by J A. If I do that, that J A also with that J A inverse gonna go away. And so the term that you will get on the left hand side is going to be j a times q double dot is equal to what? So now you will get x double dot d uh, minus j a dot q dot plus m m inverse times the bracket term and then plus m m inverse times f a correct so this is now what you will get now what now it is a good time to look at the term on the left well here now we use the definition that we had earlier that x dot is equal to j a q dot right so x dot is j a times q dot the end of vector velocities is equal to analytic jacobian times q dot if i take a time derivative from this i get x double dot to be equal to j a dot q dot plus j a q double dot and this j a q double dot is this guy so if i find it from this bottom equation it is going to be equal to x double dot minus j a dot q dot so if i now plug this guy into my top equation What's going to happen? Your left hand side is going to have negative j a dot q dot in it, and your right hand side also has what? Negative j a dot q dot in it. So both of these terms would what? Would cancel. And so what's going to be the result? The result is only going to be x double dot on the left. And on the right, you will have x d double dot and then plus m m inverse times all of that extra term the other thing you can do between this term and this term they both share m m inverse so i can factor out m m inverse out of both right and write it like this and now all i need to do is first I multiply both sides by mm okay from the left that will take care of this term make it identity both of this term now will have mm and if I bring the x double dot term to the left hand to the right hand side I will get what I will get mm times x d double dot minus x double dot plus k d times x d dot minus x dot and plus k p times x d minus x is equal to f a. Now I have what I wanted. Now, this is the result of applying my control law to the system. What is it? If you can see, this is definitely a mass spring damper system. All I need to introduce is X error, 
which is x desired minus x. If that's the case, my equation is mm times x e double dot plus uh, kd, or I guess it's km. Let's see. It's dm, actually. I used a kd all over the place and kp. What I should have been using, uh, sorry for that mistake. What I should be using is, uh, it is using dm, really. So let me stick to the notation. I'm still using the same notation I'm using for my previous control lectures. So this is dm. And this is km. Correct? And that exactly will make a... Um, mass spring damper system as you can see down here okay i fixed the other terms again i apologize for those uh, bad notations so dm times x e dot plus km times x e equals f a you see this is absolutely a mass spring damper system Differential equation in terms of the unknown x of e. And um, now what's good about this? The good thing is this. If the end effector does not touch anything, okay, then this fa is going to be what? Zero. So as long as I'm not touching anything, the force from environment to the end effector, fa is going to be zero. Therefore, I will get down to this homogeneous second-order differential equation. If I choose my gains correctly, then I can definitely get my x e of t to go to what? To go to zero asymptotically. Right? If this f a, on the other hand, is what? Not equal to zero. Then what's going to happen? So if f a is not equal to zero, I'm handling some object that does not have infinite, um, basically, uh, impedance. Then definitely it means that, based on this equation that we see, my x and x desired will be different from each other, right? I will never have those two to be the same. Okay, it seems like my stylus is not working. then definitely x and x desired are going to be two different things. So it means um, the, uh, the object is not tracking the uh, desired trajectory. Or you can look at it the other way. Because remember, this FA is not coming from a sensor. This is the force that you apply from end effector to the environment. So what does this mean? It means, well, I'm writing. Remember the example we talked about? I'm trying to write on this uh, flat piece of paper, but this time, this piece of paper, like previous case, I don't consider it to be extremely rigid. So when I'm trying to track this trajectory, if... Um, the deformation happens along the way and here the paper just goes a little bit inside and deforms it means at that location i cannot exactly follow my desired trajectory due to the deformation good so now how much force am i going to apply now that i cannot follow the desired trajectory how much force am i going to apply and the amount of force that I'm applying is determined by these three matrices now. Because I definitely have some X error and the dots of it probably. But how much? How much should I magnify those errors to calculate the force that I should apply to the environment? That comes from these three matrices. If I choose very big numbers for these matrices, guess what? I'm going to apply a lot of force from the end effector to the environment. 
If I choose small numbers, then I'm going to treat the environment a lot nicer and with a lot less force, right? So you see now the amount of force that I'm applying is controlled by these three important matrices, these desired mass spring damper matrices, okay? That's the only secret of this method, how to choose KM, DM, and MM so that we can treat different objects differently, right? And you clearly see again when the um, deformation happens, you can never expect to have perfect 100% tracking of trajectory, but at least you can control by some sacrification of the accuracy you can control how much force you are going to apply to the environment that is not fully solid and it can deform. Now, how would you choose M, M, D, M, and K, M? Because that's the biggest thing here. And the answer is this. Look, if we anticipate that we are going to have a contact, we want to apply smaller forces of contact. So how can I choose smaller contact forces? In this case, I should choose small KM forces and large MM, uh, KM entries and large AM entries. Okay, smaller K's and larger M's will lead to what? To smaller forces. Really? Yes. Why is it? Well, just consider the mass spring damper system. This is MM. This is KM. This is DM. Let's say this is your mass running on a surface without friction. Now, this is your force Fa. Correct? And this entry here is like your Xe. Good. This Xe is definitely not equal to zero as well as its time derivatives. Under what condition can I expect not to apply a lot of force Fa to create this Xe? Well, definitely, you know, a stiffer spring will counteract my force a lot. So if I want to overcome that huge spring force, I need a lot of Fa force to make it happen. So if I don't want the force Fa to be big, because I'm handling an environment that is uh, deformable. If I want FA to go down, I definitely need a spring that is not as a stiff. Now, why should big MM, on the other hand, help? Because when the M is huge, what's going to happen? When the block is very heavy, you cannot accelerate it very well. Remember, if it was just this block alone, F equals MA. So the bigger the M for a specific F, the smaller the A. And the smaller the A means the smaller this acceleration term here, this guy. Okay? So if you choose M, it makes the acceleration to be small. And you might say, well, the product still can be the same, maybe, although it's not exactly that linear. But let's say the product is still the same, so how does it benefit F? Because it seems like the product has not changed by raising M. It is not, but when X double dot goes down, guess what happens to X dot? X dot also goes down, and when X dot goes down, X can go down. So although this first term is not maybe significantly affected by a bigger choice of M, but the two other terms will go down, and that brings the whole F that you need down. So you see, 
the stiffer you choose, the uh, less stiff you choose the spring, and the heavier you choose the mass matrix in trees, right, the bigger, it leads to what? A smaller amount of force on the environment. And when would you do it? When you predict that, hey, I'm now going to have a contact. And you can do that in robot, right? When you're getting, let's say it's a pick and place job. When you're getting close to what? The final pick position, you know, now you have to apply some forces. So now it is a good time to change your entries of K to smaller and entries of M to bigger numbers. The stiffer the environment is, the softer uh, or the smaller you're going to choose values of KM. So if the first pick and place job is to pick, let's say, a hard plexiglass, maybe you don't need super small case. But if you want to pick, let's say, what? A soft tissue, a soft object or something, maybe, I don't know, some piece of food or something, you definitely do not want your end effector to crash into it and basically squeeze it into small pieces. So maybe, yes, I choose a smaller case, and of course, the smaller I choose this, it makes the error to go up a little bit. So I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of motion tracking accuracy, right? I'm not going to perfectly move on that trajectory I wanted, but at least it's a priority. I'm not going to uh, smash the object or break it, right? You have to come to a priority right what is it that you want to do do you care when let's say you are picking up a piece of food and giving it to somebody if it goes perfectly all the way to the desired location do you care about that part or you care about your end effector just uh, basically squeezing it into small pieces correct because if you have some error in the motion you still have chances of correcting it at the end of the pick and place job but if you break that piece, there is nothing to be fixed. So that's the idea. On the other hand, if the robot is now not in a direction that there is any contact, your robot is free to move, basically, then you try to bump up the values of K and make the M very small. That makes the amount of force on the environment to be very, very high. But guess what? There is nothing to be, uh, there is nothing that the end effector applies this big FA force. So the robot can move. Okay. So although there is a lot of force available at the end effector to apply to the environment, but there is nothing on its way. So it just keeps moving. And it does achieve what? Because there is no FA at the end of the day. It can achieve XD equal to X. And that means perfect tracking. Now, it shows a danger part, of course, a dangerous part. And that is when the robot is programmed to do free motion. If you get on its way, it is going to crash you. Okay? So, although... Yes, the robot is uh, not supposed to apply that force to somebody, but if somebody does try to stop the robot or gets on the way of the robot when it is trying to just do a free motion very fast, very accurate, if you get on the way, it has a lot of force available at its disposal to apply to you. So you should not get on its way by no means. Okay, The robot is not programmed to handle those sudden changes of environment. Unless, of course, it has some sensors which tell it about dynamic environment. So here we are talking about everything known ahead of hand. And what is the goal of this DM? This is to shape the transient response. What does that mean? Well, this is the damping term. The bigger you choose D, the faster it comes to stop and the faster the motion from one category to another category can, trans, can go through the transition, right? So let's say here, again, you are doing the pick and place job. So you want to come pick it up and then you are going to go up here 
and then in here you are let's say going to place it let's say in this hole correct so when I'm here at the object and I'm trying to pick it up correct because I expect what contact I am gonna bring down K and bump up M what about D if I make D smaller or uh, bigger in this scenario what's the difference the difference is basically as you can see in this system if I bump up D what's gonna happen it allows me to apply a little bit harder amount of force and uh, that is not necessarily a good thing, right? So maybe not a good thing. What about the free motion case? When the motion is free, so in between these two, remember I can achieve perfect what? Trajectory following. The bigger the D is, it makes the magnitude of this omega bigger. So you are going to get converge to your desired trajectory a lot faster. So the suggestion is when you are in the free area, still you want to choose your DM a little bit bigger than when you are what? In the contact mode. Okay. So D, you kind of treat it the same way, the way that you treat K. But M is quite the opposite. So you your algorithm for control should be what? Adjusting the values of M, K, and D depending on what it is predicting to do. Contact or just free motion. One last thing I want to emphasize or mention is Remember the control law that we had, which is all the way up here. So there is one thing that you can do to make this long control law a little bit simpler, and that is if you can eliminate this term here. How can I eliminate that term? All you need to do is to choose M and MM to be the same. In other words, the desired mass matrix, choose it to be the actual mass matrix. If you do so, then this MM inverse is going to be identity, and then identity minus identity is going to be zero. So that whole term will go to zero. And that will eliminate it, so your control law is going to be like this. Okay, so if your knowledge of the M matrix is good, choose your M inverse to be the same, M, 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 the desired M, I'm sorry, to be the same as actual M. That makes your control law a little bit simpler. What's the bad thing about it? The bad thing is the idea of this algorithm, this impedance control, is for you to adapt to the situation and change M. If you choose it to be equal to what? To the M matrix itself, then you don't have much of a control over it because remember M is a function of the uh, general coordinates, Q. So it does oscillate, it does go up and down. But it doesn't mean, let's say, one element of it, for example, M11 was like what? It was like 2 plus 0.5 cosine of Q1 or something like that, Q2. Well, this function does oscillate. But it doesn't mean when it goes down, you necessarily have what? Have free motion, and when it goes up, you have what? You have contact. Right, because it constantly changes as your robot goes from one position to other, this function can change. So although choosing this rule will make, and you might see that in some books it's suggested, although choosing this m, m equal to m will make your control law what? A lot simpler looking, it eliminates some terms, it's not in real life a good idea. So. 
because again it does not allow these selections to happen under your control it kind of does it based on how that cosine function changes so i mentioned it for you here but again i do not recommend that you necessarily what choose it that way because it does not allow you to apply this method efficiently so hopefully this uh, discussion of impedance control is useful to you in one of my future videos i make a demo for this topic and i'll discuss it separately because it is going to take another 30 40 minutes to just discuss that simulink matlab demo and i don't want to make my videos very long so let's stop this video at this point and Thank you so much for your attention. I will see you in my next video. Thank you.